Outrocast. How's your day going aside from being on the road in Germany and all that kind of stuff? Uh, my day has very, been very long. I got up at half past two this morning in order to make a flight because the flight I was managing it was cancelled because the weather and the blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I'm fine. And you've got a new record coming out in the States here in about a week and a half. When did you actually finish the Unbroken album? Last summer, uh, at some point. Yeah, seems a long time ago now. Right, the lead time between. But, but, but basically, you know, if you want to release an album, there there are windows for bands like us to release an album. You know, one is beginning of the autumn touring season, like release it in the end of August, beginning of September, which we often do. Then you need, you need to finish it by the beginning of March, or or January, in which case you definitely need to finish it by August. You know what I mean? It's like the queue. I think it's partly the queues at the vinyl factories, apart from anything else. Yes. Yeah, the the resources, the paper and the plastic and all that stuff. And, and promo. And, I, know, I, finished, that's right. I didn't listen to it for ages. And then just recently, I've listened to it again. Um, anyway, yeah, it's coming out. We're looking forward to... We haven't actually sort of worked out... We haven't sort of got ourselves together around the, you know, the idea of the tour yet, but we're meeting up on Monday and then we'll start working on it. Great. Well, it's the follow-up to your album from 2019 from here, and that charted well in the UK and Germany. So there was demand for another new model Army album, and that's a compliment, not a question. Thank you very much. I guess there's a thing we never even consider. Demand is from us. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) we want to do one. You know, we're sort of aware there's an audience out there, but... um, We've never really, uh, in fact, quite the opposite, you know, in terms of trying to sort of reach an audience or please an audience. Or if anything, we sort of, our instinct is always to go the other way. Um, You know, people ask me sometimes, you know, in the early 90s, we were were on the edge of becoming quite a big band, at least in Europe. And... uh, and it never really happened. We, you know, we don't. We're not doing arenas and big and stadiums and stuff. Um, and people say, you know, what went wrong? Well, I can think of loads of things that went that we did wrong, but to us they were right. It was like, you know, if any song threatened to become bigger than the band, our our, our response was to stop playing it. You know, the idea that you should give your audience what they want is a sort of sort of we just can't think like that it, it's it's not how we are in our dna you know you know that thing you have to do is give the play the hits you know get unite the big audience everybody say yeah yeah it's not us you know what i mean we we just make music that we think is great and that's it and and all the rest of the shenanigans you know i'm doing we're doing promo in the sense that i'm talking to you and and sort of uh so we do that but but the idea of that you know we're in a a marketplace trying to sell something um and there's lots of other things being sold it never really crosses our minds you know but you accidentally do have hit songs meaning there are some songs that are treated like whether you're in a large club or a theater or a festival, they're like anthems. So at this point in time, there's probably 10 songs that if you don't play them live, people go, oh, that's a bummer they didn't play that. And how many bands have 10 songs that the audience demands to hear? We know we've got sort of 10, 12 big songs. We know we ought to play two of them. You know, which which two is kind of up to us. You know, I think it's really important that for a band, it would be it's a death to to have songs that you have to play i you know there's some songs that we loved playing here comes the war we played for years green and gray we played for years and there did come the day when we went i'm not feeling this song anymore so the answer is stop playing it and then you leave it for 3 years or something and then you play it again you go wow i love this again fair fair assessment so and, and you know uh, 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 the, the audience yeah the, the the audience that wanted to hear the hits of their youth they stopped coming to see us years ago 
which is why we're not a you know a big fan. Um, uh, they stop coming because we don't do that. But what we've got instead is this kind of uh, audience that kind of interested in what we're doing next, and it's a smaller audience. But uh, people talk about this thing about you know success, and I remember when we you know starting in the, the days of punk rock, we 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 were, we were ambitious. We used to talk about making it. When we make it, we're going to make it. And sure. what you mean when you when you say that as a young musician, what you really mean is you're going to make a living from it. That's the big line. If you can make a living from it and not have a shit day job that you hate, and you can make a living from the music, playing the music you love, that's the big line. And we were very lucky enough to cross that in 1984. And... Uh, and that's it. After that, it really doesn't matter. You know, last time I looked at my fridge, there was food in it. You know, I don't care. You well, know, on to the next. Oh, you know, it's much more. I've got a really an idea. I've got an idea for the next one. Oh, I've really got an idea for that song. Oh, I've got an idea. I've got an idea. It's that's kind of how we started. And and people sometimes say to me, you know, you've been doing this 43 years and um, and what's, what's you know, how's it changed? But at the base level, you know, when you first start, you get in a room with a bunch of people and you make a noise that you collectively love and you collectively are proud of it. It's your noise. And it's a great feeling. 43 years later, it's basically the same process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think of you and these these are compliments. Uh, the way that you make music that has sing-along choruses and relatable lyrics, but at the same time is counterculture, it's not trying to appease to the mainstream. It's to me like Devo or New Order, where it's accidentally sing-along music. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up listening. To my, you know, my first love was Motown, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite. I like the idea of sing-along choruses. Um, I, I, quite, I still believe in the three, four minute song with the sing along chorus. I, I still think it's a, a strong thing. But uh, we've also written some things that don't quite fit into that. But I do think it's an interesting, you know, what you can get in three, four minutes. Hmm. Well, are we American fans going to see a tour of New Model Army anytime about, in the next few years? It's about fucking time. We are. Uh, we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and people in America and stuff. The problem is um, that really that by the time you pay for visas, which are incredibly expensive, sure. because of the partly because of the process, um, plus flights, plus hotels, plus transportation, plus backline, plus everything else, you know, it's how much money are you prepared to lose? <laughs> it's a question of that, really. And but uh, I, I I'm sure that well I can't promise, but I mean we are you know we are definitely looking at it definitely hopefully this year, if not next year. Right. I mean, there's the two it's kinds about, of tours. It's about bloody time. Sorry. There's the two kind of tours that an acclaimed British band will do. They're the ones where they only go to the cities where British people live. So they go to New York, Boston, Philadelphia. Los Angeles, San Francisco, or you have the Roxy music playing way too many cities where you never got radio play in and hope that the 50 cities cross collateralize into a big tour. I think there's one, there's two ways to do America. One is get in a van and drive and drive and drive. And once you finish that tour, go another part of America that you haven't done, do that. And then keep driving and keep driving, keep driving. Um, and lots of British bands are them, so trying to do that. Um, some been some have been successful, famously the police. But but there are two things with that. One is that it's the sort of thing you do when you're young. Um, uh, you know how how many people you know how how many weeks do i want to sit in the back of a van mm. yeah. um but or the other way is to have big corporate money behind you so we and we don't have that so 
I never will have. Never had. Uh, and the other thing is that if you spend weeks and where you 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 know you play you you spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks with when do you write songs? You're so tired and and you know you've got to uh, and then there is a there is a, there is the rest of the world. It does seem strange though. We're going to we're definitely going to South America this year, and hmm. um, it seems to be much easier. Yeah. So what I'm learning here is. New Model Army is not slowing down anytime soon. You have more songs in you. You have more tours in you. And so we, the fans, will continue to be rewarded with greatness. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, I I, I do feel that the people in the States of the faith over years and years and years, and we, we did have a, a, a few years when we came quite a lot, but, um, you know, we haven't been for 13 years now. And uh, you know they've kept the faith, and they go on buy records, and they write us letters and and stuff, and, and we feel oh it. <laughs> like I said, it's a question of how much money do you want to lose. <laughs> I, I don't know. I would, you know. Well, I, I have two more questions for you, and I don't know if they're going to get long answers or no. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. First one is. All we know about you is the music. We know about new model army. Hey, there's a new album. There's a new tour. You keep up on your news and your politics and you laugh at it and mock it and all that. But what's your hobby away from the music, away from the touring? Because you're kind of still a mystery all these years later. It's interesting in, the, in these days of social media, we're always told how we need to have a presence out there we need to have content you need to you need you know the day social media now you don't really need the press and, and stuff what you should do is put little snippets of rehearsals and send messages from the road and backstage clips and and uh you know that and and, and tell a little bit about your private lives and things we're not those kind of people there's something about what we do that is very we we t we say how we work, but we're not going to show people how we work. I I think with I think there's I think it's okay. I mean, you know, yes, we could be more successful if we did this, this, this. People have been telling us that forever. You know, if you did that and that and that, you'd be more successful. We're thinking, yeah, but we wouldn't be us. Um, so. You know, away from the band, I I have a uh, a life like everybody does. It's nobody's business. <laughs> well, I didn't know if you were into anything dumb. In, in other words, if you turned out to be a really oh, big I like model railways or something. No, nothing really like that. I haven't got some other kind of passion outs people. You know, stuff that's interesting. You know, of which of which world is so. Um, everything interests me, particularly nature and of which people are a part. Got it. So then my last question here is, we learn over time that A&R people and record labels often try and force bands into trends where they say, okay, metal is big right now, do a metal thing. Grunge is big, do a grunge thing. What were some of the directions that people tried to push new model army and that you went no because let's face it you're still an interesting band that sounds like I, yourselves I, I do remember i do remember a few moments going back quite a long way where at the end of the 80s we we did a couple of albums we did thunder constellation and, and impurity where we we were always interested in folk melodies rather than blues melodies you know, a lot of rock music is based on blues melodies. But myself yes. and Robert, the main writers, we both kind of really like more into folk melodies. Um, obviously, there's lots of blues in there. Um, there's lots of Motown in there, but people don't realise because they're not looking for it. Um, and uh, and I remember there were then, in the wake of, I, I guess, primarily the Pogues, but certainly us, there was this massive wave of bands in the early 90s in Britain 
with violins playing a kind of folk rock. And we were kind of at the forefront of it. And we just went, we could see a kind of folk rock cul-de-sac coming. We were kind of bored of it. And uh, and so we went off and did Love of Hopeless Causes with Nika Bolas and, and Bob Klim out in Mixed It. And it's a kind of American sounding, slightly American sounding rock album. And it's not got any violin and it's got not got any of that stuff in it at all. And everybody went, what are you doing? You found yourself a niche and now you've gone completely the other way. And we're going, are we? Uh, and again, we didn't really think about it. It wasn't deliberate. It was just where we went. And I do remember in that period that that a number of bands in Britain did, you know, they, they were sort of uh, cult bands or niche bands or whatever you call bands like us, middle-sized bands, and they would do a cover version of a famous song, and that yeah. would get them played on the radio. So I remember this guy from EMI used to come down and said, have you thought about doing, you know, recording a cover version? And we went, uh, no, not really. We've got too many of our own songs. We can play cover versions live very occasionally for fun sure. but recording one in order to get on the oh, fuck that no um, so you know going back to the one of the first things you told me that is one of the reasons why you're you that you're at the level you're at that 40 years later we still go what's justin gonna do next it's it's not gonna what are, what are we gonna tell him to do is gonna do the exact opposite of it and still gonna be pretty interesting uh a little bit. I mean, I, you know, like I say, we're not trying to please other people. We're pr primarily trying to please ourselves. Please make the wrong word. We're, you know, and every album we do is kind of a little bit of a reaction against the previous one. Yeah. You know, with From Here, we 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 deliberately wanted to take a step out of you know, Brexit and Trump and, and, and everything. And we went to this uh, Norwegian island. Um, we were going to make an album that was really big, beautiful, and bleak, and loved the landscape. And uh, and then we did. Um, and then this time, partly because of that, partly because of, we also did the symphonic project where we where we yes. did this show with an orchestra, it came out pretty well. Um, we all, and partly we became a four piece. And we played the anniversary shows, the 40, the delayed anniversary tour, where we were playing quite a lot of old material, um, uh, you know, just for the sake of it, really. And we kind of really liked being a four-piece, you know, the, the simplicity of it. And so we, you know, at the beginning of this album, we said, let's make something which is very direct and very simple. Um, which is kind of what we've done, and um, the but the album had a weird, it's a, it's a it's a bunch of demos, because what happened was that at the beginning of the process we were writing songs, we're getting ideas, we're chucking ideas down home studio, which is where we rehearse. We've got a few microphones, we know how to record things, um, uh, but we haven't got anything technical or sophisticated. Um, we were just chucking ideas down. And but very early in the process, we just wanted Chad Blake makes it if he would. So we approached Chad, and Chad said some demos. So we did, and he went, "Are these demos or are they work progress?" And we went, "Oh, the demo. We want to talk to you about where we should record it with who. Would you be interested in producing? You know, where, who we should who should." And he said, "I really like these demos because there is something when you first do a demo." Um, is that you're just chucking an idea down. And at that moment, I truly in love with the idea. I've got this idea, I'm in love with it, oh, I'm going to get it down. And there's a way that you play it, which is slightly carefree. And it's particularly true of Michael, I think, who, who's a very creative drummer. Um, but if you put him in a studio with the red light and lots of people depending on him to keep the rhythms, and, and he, he starts to play kind of carefully. Um, whereas if you just go chuck that idea you've got chuck it down he plays it like you know like it's not paying too much attention to the details it's right. it's exciting and I think Chad was saying this about the, the, what, what we recorded that, that it all felt quite exciting and he said he'd like to mix that so in the end that's what he did and we we did 
we got a little bit more serious about the recordings after he said that, but we continued to work on it. And we did lots of monitor mixes. And uh, and then we gave it to him. And we thought he would strip it down further. He'd change lots of things. Actually, what he did was basically copy our monitor mixes, but make them sound 3,000 million times better <laughs> in, in the way that some of these mixers... There seems to be this kind of, uh, the, there are a few people can. There's, there's a thousands of people that can mix records, but there does seem to be this sort of top league. And now we've worked with four of these people, you know, Clear, Clear, Bob Clear Martin, Andy Wallace, yeah. Joe Barese, and now Chad Blake. And it's a different league, really. They, they, their way of, they can um, manipulate sound. I first came... I think it was Michael that really, really wanted Chad, but I, I did too. I remember hearing a, Ch a Chad, I think it was a Black Keys record or something, on the radio when I was driving around Greece, and 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 I was hearing it, and I was thinking, is this ex very old, or is it really modern? Yeah. And it was kind of both at the same time. Agreed. And this is kind of, and this is kind of what he does, and that's what he's done with ours. It's kind of very old, and yet it's bang up to date and that's what he's brought to our record yeah well congrats on that record i'm broken congrats on the live album from last year going to number one as well and really looking forward to what's to come from you and band and just thank you for the decades of great art you're putting out into the world justin thanks very much <laughs> thank you for the compliment outro cast